Hi everyone. Let's start with our today eon topic, which is beyond obscenity. So I think this topic is about a century after the trial against Ulysses. We must revisit the civil liberty arguments of the defender of its defender, Morest Ernest. So, uh, so let's. Repeat. So let's read what this passage is called, and it is written by the Brett Gell, who is an associate professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University, and author of the Nervous Liberal Propaganda Anxiety from World War One. Of the Cold War, nineteen ninety-nine, and dirty work, obscenity on trial in America's first sexual revolution, twenty twenty-one. So let's read the first pieces. What it's hold. Upon its publication in nineteen twenty-two, critics agree that James Joyce, Ulysses, was the masterpiece of the age. No work of literature more fully embodied the experiment in literary form essential to modernism. But even its most ardent advocates had to admit to its many revelation moments. Joyce revealed in what Edmund Wilson, in 1929, described as this gross body, the body of humanity. As the literary historian Paul Wanderham asserts, the obscenity in Joyce's work is something more than a Victorian fantasy. He transgressed literary and moral category, and his book was indeed profane and profane, scatological and scalcious. So this uh, this passage is talking about the literary work of the uh, James Joyce Elsery. So the title of this passage is description of literary, not description. It's introduction of James Joyce literary work. So what we can take from here is first that uh, we can take that uh, Joyce's work is essential to modernism. Joyce's work is essential to modernism. He reveals. Joyce reveals the meaning of. Joyce reveals the meaning of, the gross body, the body of humanity, which is described by Edmund Wilson in 1929. And, we can take this as. Joy's work is transcend literary and moral category with profane, which is profane and scatological and scalcious. So let's moving toward the next pieces. All of which means it's fell a fall of obscenity laws in the United States, widely known as. Comstock laws. This legislation strictly prohibited material seen as livid, incident, lascivious, and immoral. To list some of the synonyms used to define obscenity in the federal status, lawyers, novels was rife with such matters, and Ellisors had been ruled obscene in the U.S. from its initial installment. Published in the 
Little Review magazine during the First World War. A 1928 U.S. Customs Code decisions ruled the entire book opposite. So uh, this passage is talking about how Joyce's novel affect the peoples from the uh, from affect the peoples of First World War. And uh, which is described the obscenity, different phases of different meaning of obscenity. So this title, this passage is Joy's novel effect on First World War. So let's see what we can take. that its novel ruled option in US ruled its novel Joyce novel options in the US and this line the customs court customs court decisions ruled the entire book option Let's moving forward to the next business. The fact that Olysses was still banned in US a full decade after its publication stuck denizens of the literary work as excerpt. Malcolm Cawley, editor of the New York Republic, captured the expression when he wrote sorry when he wrote that James Joyce's position in the literature is almost as important as that of Einstein in science. Preventing American author from reading him is about as as stupid as it would be a place an embargo on the theory of relativity. But Freeing Joyce masterwork from the clutches of the censor would require prodigious effort, legal uplaw, and federal judges willing to hear the book's defender. So this passage is talking about uh, the Joyce book which is banned in US and why it is necessary to why it is necessary for the US public to read about it. So, the title of this passage is Necessary to re uh, Joyce work need to be read need to be legal or need to be unbanned in America. Need to be unbanned in America. Why it is necessary to do? Because Joyce literature is almost impossible, uh, important as important as that of Einstein. So uh, here says that Joyce literature work is considered to be as important as Einstein's work. But it required prodigious efforts and federal judges. No, we can't say that, but that's it for this because this is the quite facts which we which we can't use. So let's moving toward the next passage, what it says. The two New York lawyers, Morris Leopold, Ernest, and his junior partner, Alexander Lindy, has the requisite aplomb. As revealed in a note, Lindsay wrote to Ernest in August 13, 1931 about taking up the defense of all its. I still feel very nearly that this would be grandest obscenity case in the history of law and literature. And I am ready to do anything in the world to get it started. 
Lindsay was right about its grand grandness. And their optimism about the outcome wasn't naive either. The two had already obtained the legal precedent in a series of earlier cases in which they had successfully challenged the application and administration of federal obscenity law against other notable artifacts deemed obscene. They had laid the groundwork for defending Olysses and had learned how to breach the nation's obscenity law. So uh, this passage is talking about how Ernest and Linde put their effort, uh, efforts in defending Olysses. So Ernest and the title of this uh, passage is Ernest and Lindsay Ernest and and Lindy Lindy defend for Ulysses Ulysses so so what their statement first it is given here this line i still feel a very nearly that this would be a grandest obscenity case in the history of law and literature and i am ready to do, to do anything in the world to get started so uh, lindsay is very curious a very very need to defend olysses work so that it can be read read by the world anywhere in the world by anyone so what we can take the legal precedent is a series of early case in which okay so here it says that the legal precedent done by the both the lawyers was successfully challenged the application and administration of federal obscenity law against other notable artifacts deems obscenity. So this is all we can take from this passage. Let's move toward the next passage. The federal and the state obscenity law Ernest and Lindy targeted before taking Ulysses to trial sanctions, not just the separations of literary work but the forbade the distribution of sex education material, material advice manual, and virtually anything having to do with the contraceptions, including a birth control technique and device. The Comstock Act of 9, 1873 was the most formidable of this law, formerly known as the Art Act of the Suppression of Trade in and the circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use. The statue was captured, uh, captious in its breadth, giving U.S. postal and customs officials a wide berth to patrol the mails and port of entry for allegedly illegal, allegedly obscene goods. So uh, this passage is saying, uh, talking about that how they successfully, both the lawyers successfully sanction the suppression of this literary work and it also says that this gives a legal right to lots of the options words for the custom, uh, in customs duty. So, uh, the title of this passage is How Ulysses Helps to Obscene Entry for Allegedly Obscene Good. So, uh, so, we can take this line. All is this trial sanction not just suppression of literary work but all the things which are banned which is needed to be 
it's legalized. So we can take, uh, take from here is that Olis's trial is not only for the literature work but for the other other things which are which needed to be legalized and we can take one more thing the purpose behind this is act of separations of trades in and circulation of options literature and article to immor immoral use there is main purpose to legalize this kind of a things which uh, public need to be know so let's moving toward the next passages the comstock act also gave the law or laws author anthony comstock enormous authority already the executive secretary of the new york society of the separations of vice which is a private organization financed by the city's elite the federal law enabled him to search the mails secure arrests and convictions and destroy materials site uh, Say a uh, seized from mails. He had special police power in New York City as an agent of New York Police Department, allowing him to conduct raids on bookstores, publishers, warehouse, theaters, and other sites of vice, including a house of prostitutions, gambling dens, and saloons and dance halls. So uh, this passage is talking about the Anthony Comstock. The title of this passage is description about Anthony Comstock. Anthony Comstock. Who is he? He is an executive secretary, executive secretary of New York Society for suppression of vice. Executive secretary of New York Society for sub. Separation of vice. So, what his role is? Is material seized from the mail, illegal material seized from the mail, and conduct a raid on book. Stores, publishers, warehouse, theatre, and other sites of vice, including a house of prostitutions, gambling, and dens and saloon and dance halls. So let's moving toward the next series of the passes, which is anti-vice organizations incurred virtually no opposition from politicians. So let's see what this uh, series held. So let's uh, moving toward the first passes of the series. a devout evangelical christian comstock presented himself as an avenging hero against force of moral disruption and sinfulness referring to himself as a soldier of the cross highly controversial and oft satirized satirized comstock maintained the support of many of eras elite who agreed that strictly enforced obscenity law was necessary tool for keeping sex sin disorder at bay he was brilliant published who warned against the power of sexualized popular culture to undermine the moral sensibility and self discipline upon which the social order supposedly depended So this passage is talking about how Comstock considered himself a soldier of the cross and the hero. So title of this passage is Comstock cons Comstock considered himself as soldier of the cross.
so what we can take from this passage is Thomson support the many era of allied who agree that strictly enforce you know, obscenity law so Thomson support those who are agree with uh, who are agreed against the obscenity law and and he support the brilliant published who warn against the power of sections popular culture to undermine the moral sensibility and self discipline upon which the social order supposedly depended so basically he was towards all the ethical and the moral uh, things supportable let's move in toward the next passage comstock of course was not alone there were there were anti vice organization throughout the nation largest city and small town the enlist clergy from all denominations found as a activist in women civil group drew upon the financial resource of leading male citizens and could count upon the police enforcing the law while the judge upheld them in the courts they incurred virtually no opposition from politicians so this so uh, this passage is saying that Comson is not alone in all this work. He is supported by the uh, he is supported by the large city, a wise anti-wise organizations, and a women civil groups. Who are who promote the financial resource? Uh, who are against the financial resource for the leading the male citizens? and all this are incurred virtually where no opposition from politicians let's moving toward the next passage in the law comstockry lasted well beyond his death in 1950 part, uh, partly because the court continued to uphold the law con uh, constitutionality and allow their administration to go unchecked crucially his cultural work was carried on by his successor as Vice Society head John Sangston Sun Sumner, and it is he who became the earnest primary target in the struggle over obscenity law. So here, author is saying that after the death of Comstock in 1950s, uh, 1950, his position is taken by Vice Society head John Sext uh, Sexton Sumner, and. by defending ulysses earnest more, more primary target is john sexton so let's moving to the next passages earnest was a hustler he was peripatetic he was ambitious to be known and he liked to be thought of as connected to those in power born in 1888 in the alabama He was the son of the Jewish emigrant from Pilsen, Germany, on his father's side, and second-generation Jewish emigrant on his mother's side. His mother took ill when he was a child. He lived with an uncle and aunt, separated from his sibling. In an interview late in life, he reflected that he had no ancestors and no past. Asked, asked to explain, he said. he had no great grandfather no rootness no sense of security his second wife margaret samuel who came from a well established jewish family in new orleans had security i had not he continued i am a ham i like publicity so uh, this passage is talking about uh, some brief description about the past and the family relation of Ernest. So it says that the Ernest uh, Ernest born in 1888 in Alabama, and who is a Jewish immigrant from his father's side, 
oh no sorry zhu is emigrant from his mother side and german german from his father side but he says that because of uh, his mother is ill or he is ill his mother is ill then his mother send him to his uncles and aunt where and after that uh, who just upbring him and in the late in his life he just shared that he has no ancestors and no past he had no great grandfathers and there is no rootness he has no sense of security but his second wife margaret samuel who came from the well established jewish family she had security but he don't and he said he he is a ham he like publicity let's moving to other next places his second generation emigrant sensibility and his attendant insecurity come across potently in his this interview he did not discover uh, discuss his jewishness per se other than calling himself a non worshipping jew perhaps he did not discuss his jewish identity much because it made him feel vulnerable his biographer joel silverman writes that on its recall how he was mocked during his formative years of his appearance i had been brought up to believe that i was ugly i was uh, it, i had uncle who always kid me about my big jewish nose which did my ego no good he also remember being told that i was jewish and for that reason inferior so here is a, uh, this passage is talking about the some of the life uh, life events which is not good of earnest which is described by which is disclosed by his biographer joel silverman who says that his uncle oftenly mocked him because of kidding him about because of his jewish nose and in no uh, child who he was bullied because uh, bullied and mocked for being an ugly and he considered himself that he was jewish for that reason it was inferior so let's moving toward the next passages Ernest internet internalized the financial precariousness of emigrant to his father Karl Ernest made and occasionally lost money in the real estate business so his family endured difficult periods still Karl had enough financial success that he could send Morris to the prestigious Horace Mann School in New York for NV Legu prep and then to William College in Manchester at Williams Ernest was one of the few Jewish students and was aware of how his Jewishness small physical stature marked him but he was gregarious a successful debater fit in well enough to be accepted into a Jewish fraternity upon a graduation he lived in New York City working in the family shirt making business it's established by his father and uncle and took up night class at the new york law school where other emigrant and jewish took their legal education ernest later formed his law firm greenbaum wolf and ernest dwe with a with jewish student he met at william college so uh, this passage is talking about ernest education's background which says that on a once uh, on a estate business his father uh, business is in loss but he has enough money to send him to preparation of the ivy league queue and the william college in manchester where uh, after joining the college ernest working uh, in uh, in days ernest working in his um, in his uh, family's cut making shirt making business and at night having educations on law with other jewish children 
and later he found his own form GWA with the other Jewish student whom he met in William College. So uh, that's all for today. Let's uh, continue this process in tomorrow's video. For that, thank you.